Tonight on Free Minds TV, President Obama threatens to do something good if Congress doesn't behave themselves. We'll also be getting into thirsting out illegals, why a lot of college students aren't getting jobs, plus a whole lot more coming up tonight on Free Minds TV. Thank you for tuning in to episode 230 of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, is Toby. And Nick. We've got a lot to get into, Nick. We are going to be getting into that story about thirsting out illegal immigrants, as well as Obama threatening to do some good if Congress doesn't get their act together and do what he wants. We'll be getting, exactly, getting into exactly what that means in the latter half of t uh, the show, plus a whole lot more. But first, I saw something that was absolutely amazing, Nick. Insane, in fact. A news headline that just caught my attention and I couldn't let it go. And I think it's important that we talk about it on the show. We've talked about, well, if there was an antichrist in the world, if I believed in him anyways, I, I think I would put that picture on Monsanto, or at least the company which is Monsanto. And man, oh man, it just seems to, it seems to be getting real, Nick. We talked yeah. about this story a few weeks ago, at least the beginnings of it about a judge who said there is no right, you do not have a fundamental right to food and to grow your own food and well, that judge did exactly what you'd expect him to do, I guess. Well, yeah, when I saw the headline, I was amazed that it really works this way, that things are really this bad and it's really this blatant. The kind of, you'll hear people talk a lot with legislators about a revolving door, where basically legislators pass regulations and laws that benefit certain industries or certain companies, and then they go to work in those industries and companies, pretty obviously just, you know, basically making a business out of lawmaking so that you know they can they can do good by a corporation and then they can get a really high paying job with a corporation a lot of people say well congress people don't really make that much money well the money is in political favor and what your friends are going to do for you when you get out um, now this is a follow-up on the story about uh, former judge patrick j fielder who now he was a judge in wisconsin ruled saying that uh, against a, a case by plaintiffs that were arguing for the freedom to produce food for themselves in the way that they wanted to, he made the ruling that you do not have the right, let's say you own a cow, to actually milk the cow and drink the raw milk if the state of Wisconsin were to say that you did not. So basically saying that he even went further in a clarification on the decision to say that, yes, I mean, you do not have a right to produce your own food and eat it. The state of Wisconsin, this is the only place where he has jurisdiction, but he's saying the state of Wisconsin has the authority to tell you what you can and cannot eat, whether you grew it yourself or not. Now, he has gone to work for uh, Axley Brin Brinelson, LLP, which defended Monsanto against a patent infringement case filed by, by the Australian firm Genetic Technologies Limited in early 2010. Uh, GTL had sued several biotechnology firms, a medical lab and a crime lab that had used its patented methods for analyzing DNA sequences. Though a, f uh, though a federal case, the uh, or, um, yeah, though a federal case, the district court which heard this matter sits in Dane County, Wisconsin, where Fielder coincidentally served as a state judge and recently made this ruling saying, "You don't have a right to freely consume food, Toby." Now. We've talked about these issues before. They, they get into uh, another connection here. In another link, Myriad Genetics, which holds the exclusive U.S. patent on human genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, granted the license to GTL in 2002. These human genes are associated with breast and ovarian cancer. In an absurd ruling this year, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals allowed the patent on these human genes, even though the DNA sequence occurs in nature. The court decided that simply because researchers had been able to extract it, the firm owns it. Of course, under this thinking, all of nature can be patented if human technology allows extraction. That's in fact the case. Um, a lot of people do point out that Monsanto does these things with patenting certain kinds of seeds. A lot of people are very troubled by the fact that a lot of them are terminator seeds. So basically, they sell the seeds, the seeds grow into fruit, but that fruit is sterile. It doesn't produce its own seeds. They don't seed themselves. So basically, you have to keep going back to the company. Yeah, and furthermore, uh, another very troubling thing is this has happened many times where, uh, say, Monsanto will plant a crop on one side of uh, a road and then the far local farmer will plant a crop on the other side of the road. Monsanto's pollen will come and 
um, get into the local farmer's crop, then Monsanto will sue him for stealing their intellectual property of their um, their specialized uh, genetically altered crop. You yeah. think if, it, if there was a lawsuit there in any way, shape, or form, it would be that you could, the farmer that's crops were contaminated with a genetic strain that he didn't want should be able to sue Monsanto. I don't even, I don't really think that's the way it should necessarily work. I mean, plants cross pollinate all the time, but, and I don't really well, particularly kinda. have a huge, I don't have a huge amount of concern about GMOs. Some people do. Well, if you're trying to grow your own plants and then get yeah. seeds out of them, I do. I mean, yeah. Monsanto's essentially, yeah. if that's what he's doing, he's ruining your he's ability damages. to, yeah. he's ruining your ability and to grow crops. Historically, when you're talking about anything when you're talking about pollution or contamination or in agriculture if you're talking about pigs or sheep or plant genetics historically it's been considered a, a farmer's responsibility to keep their animals and i guess in this case plants in if your pigs break out and eat somebody else's crops that's your fault not the person who has the crops fault you don't sue the person whose crops are destroyed for feeding your pigs something you didn't want them to eat Yet, that was your fault. Right, yet Monsanto is such a big company. They seem to have bought off the judges because the judges routinely are ruling in their favor. Allegedly, I should say. Monsanto, well, he's too big to care about crushing us. Um, <laughs> oh, I say he. It's a big company. It's a big old corporation. I just think of him as one yeah. big evil no, guy. No, I don't. You know what? I don't, I don't really particularly... I, I don't, Monsanto has done some things which I find... I don't care whether they're legal or not or whether the judges have ruled that they're correct or not. Uh, a lot of their business practices are unethical, they're unsavory. Um, frankly, some of them um, should just out and out be legal, in my opinion. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's amazing to me that we are at the point where you've got corporations patenting not just genes and food crops, but they're patenting human genes here. Genes that occur in nature. Because We're in a very strange place, and yeah. I, I mean, this is where... You know, I mean, I, as far as patents go, copyright, I'm a little bit more uh, circumspect about. But as far as patents go, I, can, I don't really have a problem with patents. But when you start talking about patenting genes and you start talking about patenting really just whole classes of organisms and parts of my body, that seems a little insane to me, Toby. Like, it, it seems like... Whoever makes rulings like that should just never be allowed to sit on a bench ever, ever again. Well, because they're an insane person. They will, Nick. And the world is insane, full of insane stories. It's time to move on to another one. It's coming from Alabama. Here's a story we've been talking about for a while. It's all about the illegals, Nick. Those people in Alabama, they sure don't want them to live there, at least some of them. And they've passed quite the sweeping immigration law, saying essentially that if anybody suspects someone of being an illegal immigrant, they've got to uh, report them or whatnot. One of those stipulations in uh, the new immigration law, Section 30, to be specific, states that um, no company, no governmental company or a government subsidiary company shall do any kind of business with an illegal immigrant. And DU Water, uh, Dictator Utilities, is now prohibiting, prohibits illegal immigrants from obtaining, obtaining electric, gas, water, or sewer services, an official said on Friday. DU Business Manager Chief Stefan Prickle said that DU previously required residents seeking utilities to provide identification, but their immigration status was not relevant. Well, guess what? Now it is! Um, because the law states that um, those who do business can be served with a felony, they're all done serving illegals if they don't produce immigration status, proper immigration status. Section 30 of the uh, Beeson, Hammond, Alabama Taxpayers and Citizens Protection Act requires the state and its political sub subdivisions to confirm that individuals, including business transactions, which the law defines as any transaction, are, illegal, are, are legally present in the United States. Uh, the law makes it a felony for legal residents to enter into transaction with the state or its subdivisions on behalf of undocumented immigrants. The conspiracy clause also states that anybody who assists illegal immigrants through any of these processes will be guilty of a felony. So Nick, I guess they're gonna thirst them out. Make sure that they don't have no any- No flushing toilets, no, no flushing running toilets, water. No gas, no electric. That's how they get rid of them. You know, 
We, we Do you talk- think there might be some unintended consequences to this legislation? Well, I think that there already have been. I think the unintended consequences are the undocumented workers said, well, we're going to go work somewhere where we're wanted and all the tomatoes yeah. and other crops there rotted on the vine. Yeah. We talked about that. Where uh, I mean, even NPR was reporting on the story that a lot of the farmers in Alabama were basically, it looks like they're going to go bankrupt as a result of this because they lost their immigrant labor force. And it's, I, I'd like to bring it up. People say, well, Americans should be doing those jobs. Well, uh, frankly, a lot of Americans wouldn't work that hard for that kind of money. And you used to fill farm work. A lot of farm labor was done by young people, by children. Um, now I've, I've read the New Hampshire Farm Bureau actually put out some information saying that uh, the US, I think it's the USDA or it's, I don't know if the USDA is doing it or if it was a different agency that was actually implementing the rules. But a lot of the laws that apply um, to protecting workers under the age of 18 and workers under the age of 16 we're going to be extended to farms, Toby. And I think we talked about that here. If you're not a child of the, the actual farmer, the person who owns the farm, you're not going to be able to do a lot of the jobs on the farm that if you're not using immigrant labor and the legal immigration process to get agricultural workers into the country is Byzantine. It's, it's not an easy process. It's expensive. It's time consuming. So, a lot of people either need to, if they're going to get crops picked, they either need to hire people who are undocumented, who are migrant workers, or they need to hire kids. But at the same time that a lot of parts of the U.S. are tightening up on immigrant labor, they're cutting out a, a whole section of the population that really used to do this kind of work. You can't have it both ways. If you want Americans to do work, you can't have a regulatory system that prevents them from learning how to work. And we have a story that's actually, we're going to get into that, aren't we, Toby? Because a lot of young people here don't know how to work. Well, they don't like they like the, the kind of work that actually is going out and picking vegetables off the vine. No, so or, manual or, labor. Or, or that's hard, right? But, you know, it's before, challenging. Yeah, before we move on from this story, I just want to point out um, there are real consequences of this besides driving illegal immigrants out of Alabama. There are kids involved, there are old people involved, there are people with medical conditions involved. When you cut them off of some basic necessities, water, sewer, electric, gas, things they're paying for. They're being customers and paying for these utilities and you're cutting them off. There are consequences. I don't care how racist you are. You don't care about the kids. It baffles my mind, Nick. And they are down in Alabama. They are not all of them, some of them actually do see the ramifications, but the people who passed this legislation, they're cheering this on about how great it is, about how they're doing so much good. It, it seems just so wrong yeah. to me. Yeah, well, you know, it's, unfortunately it's always, you know, for, throughout most of the U.S.'s history, it's always been the relationship that we've had with in, whatever the latest immigrant group is, they're usually viewed with suspicion and then laws are enacted that don't work to their favor. I mean, that's nothing new. I'm not saying that makes it right or it makes it any better, but it's nothing new. And it's, it's unfortunate when you look back on the attitudes that people have held throughout our history, it's, I don't know, at least it gives you some context because pretty much people have always said the sky is falling and that these new immigrants are gonna destroy the American way of life. And to a small extent, that's true. When you're a nation that's comprised of immigrants, uh, you know, you don't have a very old, we don't have a very old or established culture in this country. When new groups come in, it does change the fabric of the society. It does change, it changes the kind of food we eat. It changes some cultural attitudes. And frankly, I think that's a really good thing because a lot of the, if, if we had just stayed with the, the early American colonists and their views of life, it would be a pretty bland, just not very fun to live in the country. I don't think. I'm not a big fan of Puritanism. No. And I'm, there wouldn't be very much diversity. There wouldn't be a whole lot of variety. It would just be, I don't know. True. It'd be like a subset of England. So, yeah, frankly, immigrants do change things. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And the work ethic that a lot of undocumented workers from, mostly we're talking about Latin and Central America, I mean, 
I, I think that's a positive contribution they're making to the society, one that a lot of Americans could learn from. Yeah, definitely a lot more positive than these racists passing all these bigoted laws. Yeah. Anyways, moving right along, Obama threatens to do good. Yeah. He's like, if you, Congress, don't do what I ask, I'm going to do something that the American people would really like. Yeah. Uh, what, what the Obama administration is, is threatening to do here um, is that the, it's been discovered that the administration may be planning to use, uh, well, President Obama may be planning to use his executive authority to publicize special funding requests that lawmakers make for pet projects, uh, you know, quite often things in their home district. That's how this works. When we're talking about pork barrel spending, well, in this case, we're not necessarily talking about appropriations that are being made through the legislative process in Congress. You know, the earmark process exists. It's been very well documented. Um, you know, we always hear these calls for earmark reform. Does it really happen? No. Um, but in this case, what they're doing here is that they're, they're requesting money for their home districts, as you would through the earmark process, but instead of actually passing an appropriations bill or attacking their little special project onto an existing piece of legislation, which is usually how they do it, um, what they're doing here is uh, appealing to executive branch agencies to request special consideration for a group of project that is seeking federal funding. So what they're doing here is that they're just writing letters to a agencies in the executive branch saying, you know, with all that grant money you have, maybe you could give it to this organization in my district, most likely. Such a decision by the White House could cause embarrassment for members who say they do not request earmarks, but who have written to executive branch agencies seeking special consideration for funding. So they're saying they need to do this. Do well, it, Obama. Hey, if not, them. here's the thing. If, if you're saying, well, there's, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't pork, this isn't trying to bring money back into my district to curry political favor with the voters, well, if that's not what you're doing, then why do you care? If you're doing something that's good and you're saying, well, I'm just trying to help nonprofits in my district, well, then you should be happy. You'll get credit, won't you? But that's not what most of you are doing because you seem to have a problem with it. If, if you thought you would get credit and people would clap for you, you wouldn't be opposing it because you're politicians and you want to be popular. That's what you have to do to get elected. So the fact that this would put Congress into an uproar if it's enacted tells me that they don't want the credit, which means that they're not really using this in ways that much of the public is going to like. This makes me like the idea of earmarks. Doesn't that make a sense? Isn't Nick? that rational? Absolutely. Nobody actually says this in a lot of the discourse, though. But you know what? This, the, no, this stuff makes me think things. about how good it would be to actually just have earmarks, because at least you have the, their names attached to the different bills that they vote for, and you can see if you want to. No one does, of course. It would be way too much work to actually see what your so-called elected representatives vote on. Um, but, but at least there would be the option there. With these letters, it's all secretive? Well, I guess I didn't know that. Yeah, Call secret me letters. Foolish! I didn't know about these secret letters. Yeah, who, who uh, knew? Frankly, I didn't either. I mean, I I would assume that these kinds of backdoor I mean backdoor deals would take place, or secret deals would take place, in Washington D.C., wherever you've got, you know, a lot of money sitting around and bureaucracies and politicians who have people that would really like to be connected with some of that funding in exchange for some campaign support next year you're going to get this kind of thing. And it's not just in Washington, D.C. This happens in a lot of state capitals. It happens in countries all around the world. It's not like a, a problem that's unique to the U.S., Toby, that's unique to Washington. It's just typically how politics works. It's a dirty business. I mean, people say that, but I don't think they understand just how true it is. It's by and large, not every single politician is dirty, but by and large, I think it's an accurate generalization to say that politics is a dirty business. And it's, it's really not about ideas or what you believe in. When you actually look at how it works, it's just, it's just I'm sorry, it's, it's basically a business. I still like the idea. Where you get to use force. Yes. Uh, police force is on your side, so that always helps. True. Commentator Dan Carlin, he has an excellent podcast out there called Common Sense. If you like this show, I suggest you check that out. I, I like his idea of what politicians have to do in order to be honest about what they represent. Instead of coming to Washington in a suit and a tie, he suggests that they do what NASCAR 
um, athletes do and dress up in, in a suit with the different logos of the companies that they actually represent right on them. They have a patch of Exxon Mobil maybe, or maybe some, so they get some money from uh, Walmart or, or where maybe they're getting it from the Chinese government too. You know, they actually do get that. The different governments are actually giving campaign dollars to U.S. representatives to vote for interests in other countries. That's really happening, but most American people don't know. Well, they, 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 I think there are some laws against doing it openly but, I think they, but funnel, they do it they fund yeah they funnel yeah. the money through it the shell and if that was honest nick yeah. and if they actually wore all that stuff i think that would be great maybe they could instead of having a limousine that's all black or just big old suv they could even have their cars be all they could do product placements too yes exactly hold up the products when no. they're speaking on the floor i think that would be excellent today i'm being represented by mcdonald's or monsanto is sponsoring this speech I think it would be excellent. And then the American people could see who really represents them. It's the interests of big corporations. Yeah, that is in fact how it works. I mean, I think, uh, I don't think it's overseas. I think some politicians, you know, they do go to Washington and they, you know, they do have personal beliefs and they do have, uh, you know, an ideology of their own to some extent. Uh, but even if that's the case, they get so wrapped up in trying to, you know, win the nomination in their party or beat the other you know, the candidate that the other party has put up, that even if they went to Washington with the intention of, uh, you know, just representing their constituents or representing the ideals they believed in, well, frankly, if you're not going to play dirty and get all that corporate money, your opponent is. So you're going to be a one-termer. Yeah, plus... And yeah, how do you get elected in the first place? Yeah, and if you're it's, not... If you're, an, if you're just... A, frankly, if you're just a, an honest person who actually you know, candidly represents what they believe, and you don't believe in taking special interest money, you have no chance, well, really. Even I mean, if you do get elected, no one's, chance, you're going to be alone. You're going to be voting on things alone. Right. No one, you, none of your friends are going to, you're not going to have any friends because all your friends are wrapped up with right. the big corporations. What if 40 or 50 of them get elected, Toby? Then 10% of the Congress is actually trying to represent real issues. They wouldn't agree, but they'd actually be trying to represent real issues, except 90% even with 40 or 50 representatives like that, about 90% are still going to be playing the game. So Awfully depressing. Yeah. I say... Our incumbent re-election rates are, are higher than, than they have been for much of American history, too. It's like 90%, 90 plus percent now. Yes. That's ins I mean, people complain about Congress a lot. It's got less... A lot of times it's less than a 20% approval rating. And yet, through much of American history, half of Congress, every time, you know, every chunk of... Congress that was up for election during that period would get shuffled out. Half of the incumbents would be gone. And people complain a lot about how they're not represented and things like that, but apparently there's an electorate out there that's still willing to just go out and 90% of the time you're going to re-elect the incumbent. So you, a lot of people out there are dissatisfied with the status quo now, but somehow there's this disconnect where they don't realize that if you want to affect change for the political process, and I don't see the point of voting if you don't unless you enjoy going to the polling station it is kind of cool you get to pull the curtain behind you and it feels important there's lots of nice people at the but, polling station Nick. but um yeah i mean if your goal is actually to change things and many many of you you might not agree with us but many of you out there watching uh, are not happy with the way things are well if you're not happy with the way things are why do you keep voting for the people who made things this way and is it really that hard to realize the, the next batch of candidates, like during the, the, this presidential campaign that we're going, suffering through right now, Toby, um, and we suffer through it more than most because we're in New Hampshire. Maybe those of you in Iowa can understand. We have to listen to just so much, yeah, garbage, I guess, would be the, the appropriate word. There was another word I was going for, but a lot of our, the stations at Eris wouldn't like it. So I, it's just... I just don't understand. I mean, to me, it's it's very easy to tell that most of the candidates are very artificial. So, yeah, go out and vote for something new. Go vote for Herman Cain or Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney, that's he's going to bring real change, isn't he, Toby? They're all going to bring gonna change. Going to shake things up. Shake things up. Vote for another corporation. Well, anyways, Nick, you know, I think the people who are so-called representing on us, uh, to a large extent, unfortunately, they are a reflection of society. It's depressing to think about. Sometimes I just think the whole, it would be better if elections were rigged. Um, it would make me feel better about the world if I knew that all the elected, those so-called elected representatives had cheated the system and somehow just 
uh, got control of the country through uh, rigging the voting machines and stuff, but unfortunately that's not the case. They, the people really are going out there and voting for them and campaigning for these people and well, it's sad, but it's true. And the polls out there, they just show that society, in my opinion, seems to be crumbling at the scenes. Now I'm a young person, I should be on board with these technologies like the interwebs and everything, which I, I like the internet. I spend a good deal of time on the internet. But I just can't buy into these social networking sites, the Twitters and the, the Facebooks and stuff. Um, they, they bother me. I, I th find them time consuming and, and soul sucking. But most people <laughs> my age would disagree. In fact, one in three college grads said that ac to access to social media sites like Facebook and the ability to choose their own devices was more important to them than salary when considering a job offer. This according to a study of 2,800 college students and young professionals worldwide conducted by Cisco. More than 40% went so far as to say that they would accept less money for a job that was down with social media at work. The study was intended to determine what the millennium generation wants from employers and what to consider um, to, what to, consider to be equitable, wor equitable work slash life balance. Not surprisingly, they overwhelmingly wanted flexible work hours and remote access with about one third of college students saying that uh, once they begin working, it was their right, not a privilege, to be able to work remotely with a flexible schedule. Over half of college students globally, 56%, said that they, uh, if they were offered a job at a company that banned access to social media, they would either turn it down or ignore the policy. And there's lots of other statistics out there, but man, Nick, in this, in this economy. Yeah, I mean, a lot of college students, um, unemployment rates a lot higher for recent college grads than you know, a lot of people. And you're still willing to turn down work because of these social networking sites. By the way, I, I would largely agree with you about Facebook and Twitter. I think people spend way, I know I sound like a lot of, and that just doesn't, you spend, why don't you actually go interact with people? Or if you spend, some people spend like eight, 10, 12 plus hours a week easily on Facebook. Well, here's an idea. Instead of adding friends on Facebook, why don't you actually go out and make real friends and spend time with them in your free time? And the other thing, Toby, is this story is not really so much about social networking. I don't think it's attitudes towards... Slackers. Yeah, I mean... They want to be able to do... It's a, a it's ADHD work. society. It's called work. Have you ever tried to the, write a do paper people not understand that you, Do young people not understand that when you go to work, you're there to do something not productive? Anymore. And that what you... Your hobbies and things, like that's They're, not where you do that. You do that out outside of, time. of work. We're out of time. From working. We'll be outraged on our own time. Until next week, it's been Toby here and with Nick. you. FreeMindsTV.com. Until next week.